Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering chapter 2 for our MCAT behavioral science playlist and this chapter is titled Sensation and Perception. Now what we're going to cover in this chapter are the following objectives. First and foremost, we're going to talk about sensation versus perception. Here in this objective, we'll touch on sensory receptors, we're going to touch on thresholds, signal de uh, detection theory, as well as adaptations. Then we'll move into the second objective titled vision. Here we'll cover the structure and function of the eye, visual pathways, and processing. In the third objective, we're going to do the same thing but for the ear. We're going to cover structure and function of the ear, auditory pathways, and we'll touch basis with hair cells as well. The fourth objective will focus on some of the other senses. We'll talk about smell, taste, somatosensation, and kinesthetic sense before moving into our last and final objective, which is about object recognition. Here we're going to cover Gestalt's principles. With that being said, let's go ahead and start this chapter with our first objective titled sensation versus perception. Now in common day-to-day -day use, people often use sensation and perception interchangeably as synonyms. However, in the field of psychology, these two terms have very specific definitions, and they're commonly contrasted. So sensation more appropriately aligns with transduction. This is the conversion of physical, electromagnetic, auditory, and other information from our internal and external environment to electrical signals in the nervous system. Sensation is performed by receptors in the peripheral nervous system, which forward these stimuli to the central nervous system in the form of action potentials and neurotransmitters. Sensation can therefore be thought of as a raw signal. It's unfiltered and unprocessed until it enters the central nervous system. Perception, on the other hand, it refers to the processing of this information to make sense of its significance. These complex manipulations are going to include both external sensory experience and the internal activities of the brain and spinal cord. So in short, perception helps us make sense of the world. Now, with the definition of sensation versus perception being covered, we want to move into a discussion about sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are neurons that respond to stimuli and then they trigger electrical signals. Sensory receptors can encode multiple aspects of a stimulus. So for example, photoreceptors are going to respond to light and they can encode not only the brightness of the light, but also the color and the shape. And so this relationship between the physical nature of the stimuli and the sensations and perceptions they evoke is something that we want to talk about in this chapter. And it's studied in the field of psychophysics. Now, in order to inform the central nervous system, the signals from these stimuli, they must pass through a very specific sensory pathway. And in each case, different types of receptors, generally nerve endings or specific sensory cells, they're going to receive the stimulus and then they're going to transmit the data to the central nervous system through sensory ganglia. Ganglia are collections of neuron cell bodies that are found outside the central nervous system. Once this transduction occurs, the electrochemical energy is going to be sent along neural pathways to various projection areas in the brain, and there they're going to be further analyzed. The sensory input will be further analyzed. Now, sensory receptors differ from one sense to another, and there's actually over a dozen of recognized sensory receptors. But for the MCAT, we're only going to concern ourselves with a couple, and we're going to go over those now. First and foremost, you want to be familiar with photoreceptors. These respond to electromagnetic waves in the visible spectrum. Then we have hair cells. They respond to movement of fluid in the inner ear structures. Nosoceptors, they respond to painful or noxious stimuli. Thermoreceptors are going to respond to changes in temperature. 
Osmoreceptors, these respond to osmol uh, osmolarity and uh, of the of the blood specifically. And then olfactory receptors, these are going to respond to volatile compounds. And then last but not least, we have taste receptors. These respond to dissolved compounds. Now, that is sensory receptors for ourselves. And what this helps us transition into is a discussion about our next topic, which is thresholds. Perception, like sensation, is closely tied to the biology and physiology of interpreting the world around us. However, unlike sensation, perception is linked to experience and both internal and external biases. Sensations are related to the brain, which perceive the significance of the stimulus, for example, determining whether something is hot or cold. That same sensation, though, it can produce radically different perceptions in different people. And because these variations have to be explained by central nervous system activity, perception is considered part of psychology. Now, a good example of the psychological element of perception is threshold. Threshold is the minimum amount of stimulus that re renders a difference in perception. So for example, the temperature, it may noticeably change from warm to cool when the sun sets, but subtle fluctuations in temperature throughout the day are generally unnoticeable because they are below the difference threshold. That is true unless you live in Texas where the temperature changes by the minute. Now, there are three main types of thresholds that we want to cover and be familiar with for the MCAT. This is going to be absolute threshold, threshold of conscious perception, and difference threshold. Let's go ahead and start with this first, absolute threshold. This is the minimum of stimulus energy that's going to be needed to activate a sensory system. It is therefore a threshold in sensation, not in perception. The second one is threshold of conscious perception. So it's possible for sensory systems to send signals to the central nervous system without a person perceiving them. This may be because the stimulus is either too subtle to like demand our attention, or it may last for too brief of a duration for the brain to actually fully process the information. Now, subliminal perception often refers to the perception of a stimulus below a given threshold, and this term refers to the threshold of conscious perception. Now, here's a good point for us to note the difference between the absolute threshold and the threshold for conscious perception. A stimulus below the absolute threshold is not going to be transduced. And so that means it never reaches the central nervous system. But a stimulus below the threshold of conscious perception arrives at the central nervous system, but it just doesn't reach the higher order brain regions that control attention and consciousness. Then last but not least, we want to talk about difference threshold. The difference threshold or just noticeable difference, this refers to the minimum difference in magnitude between two stimuli before one can perceive this difference. So for example, most individuals without formal ear training find it pretty impossible to discriminate between sound waves at 440 hertz and 441 hertz. While they are two different frequencies, the perception of the tones is that they're the same. In this range of sound frequencies, the just noticeable difference is about three hertz. So most individuals just begin to hear a difference between sound waves at 440 hertz and 443 hertz. Now, while the just noticeable difference given for sound frequencies is three hertz and above, it's far more important actually to focus on the ratio between the change in stimulus and its original value. And so 
that is more important. It's more easy to interpret the information than just actual differences between the frequencies. And so the just noticeable difference for sound frequency is more accurately quantified as 0.68%. How did we get that? We got that by taking three hertz and dividing it by 440 hertz. So the just noticeable difference over the sound frequency of interest. This relationship has actually been formalized in Weber's law, which states that there is a constant ratio between the change in stimulus magnitude needed to produce a just noticeable difference and between the magnitude of the original stimulus. With that, we've discussed the three main types of thresholds, the absolute threshold, threshold of conscious perception, and difference threshold. Now we want to move on to talking about signal detection theory. Perception of stimuli, it can also be affected by non-sensory factors, such as experience, memory, motives, expectations. And this concept is termed signal detection theory, and it focuses on the changes in our perception of the same stimuli depending on both internal and external context. So a good example to start off with to motivate this idea is how loud would someone need to yell your name in a crowd to get your attention? And part of that answer comes from psychology. If you heard something that sounds vaguely like your name, would you likely acknowledge it or not? And the answer is not just a simple yes or no, but it would depend on a couple of factors. What's the size of the crowd? What are your expectations of being called? What are the social factors at play? All right. And what's your personality? So all of these factors come into play when trying to answer the question, if you heard something that sounds vaguely like your name, would you likely acknowledge it or not? Now, signal detection theory also allows us to explore something called response bias, and this refers to the tendency of subjects to systematically respond to a stimulus in a particular way due to non-sensory factors. So a basic signal detection experiment is going to consist of many trials, and during each trial, a stimulus or signal may or may not be presented. Trials in which the signal is presented are called catch trials, and trials where that signal is not presented is called a noise signal. Now, trials, after each trial, the subject is asked to indicate whether or not a signal was given. And so there are actually four possible outcomes for each trial. You have hits, this is where the subject correctly perceives the signal. You have misses in which the subject fails to perceive a given signal. False alarm. This is what when the subject seems to perceive a signal, but none was given. And correct negatives in which the subject correctly identifies that no signal was given. Now, something that's also important in this discussion to talk about is adaptation. And this refers to the fact that our detection of a stimulus can change over time through adaptation. So adaptations can have both a physiological component and a psych psychological component. So in other words, a sensory component and a perceptual component. A good example is think about how your eyes adjust to darkness, right? The pupils of the eyes are going to dilate in the dark and they're going to constrict in the light to make our vision more similar in different environments as part of physiological adaptation. With that being said, we've completed everything that we wanted to talk about in our first objective. And what we're going to do next is transition into our second objective, which is all about vision. Now, vision is a highly adapted sense in human beings with the ability to sense brightness, color, shape, and movement, and then integrate this information to create a cohesive three-dimensional model of the world. The visual pathways are extremely important to everyday life. In fact, vision is the only sense to which an entire lobe of the brain is devoted to, and that's the occipital lobe. With that being said, what we first want to do in this objective is really cover the structure and the function of the eye before we move into 
visual pathways and processing. Let's go ahead and get started by looking at this figure right here. The eye is a specialized organ to detect light that's used to detect light in the form of photons. Most of the exposed portion of the eye is covered by a thick structural layer known as the sclera. I'm going to circle where that is in blue right now. And this is the white of the eye. The sclera, though, it does not cover the frontmost portion of the eye, the cornea, which is located right here. Now, the eye is supplied with nutrients by two sets of blood vessels, the choroidal vessels and the retinal vessels. The innermost layer of the eye is the retina. It's located right here, and it contains the actual photoreceptors that transduce light into electrical information that the brain can process. Now, when entering the eye, the light passes first through the cornea, which is like a clear dome-like window in the front of the eye, and it essentially gathers and focuses the incoming light. Now, the front of the eye is divided into two chambers, the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. The anterior chamber lies in front of the iris, and the posterior chamber is between the iris and the lens. Now, the iris located over here, this is the colored part of the eye. It's composed of two muscles, the dilator and the constrictor pupillae. The dilator opens the pupil under sympathetic stimulation and the constrictor constricts the pupil under parasympathetic stimulation. Now, the iris is continuous with the choroid, as is the ciliary body, which produces the aqueous humor, haha, that bathes the front part of the eye before it drains into the canal of Schlem. Now, the lens, they lie right behind the iris, and it helps control the refraction of the incoming light. Contraction of the ciliary muscle, which is a component of the ciliary body, is under parasympathetic control, and so, as the muscle contracts, it pulls on the suspensory ligaments and it changes the shape of the lens. This is a phenomenon that's known as accommodation. Then behind the lens lies the vitreous. This is a transparent gel that supports the retina. Now, the retina is a really interesting part of the eye that we want to discuss further. And specifically, we want to talk about duplexity or duplicity theory of vision as well. What I do want to show you, though, is that we have just verbally talked about the different parts of the eye, but the notes for the functions of each of these structures that we've talked about are written right here. So what the cornea, the iris, the lens do, ciliary body, uh, the vitreous, so on and so forth. Again, what we all want to elaborate on here now is the retina. This is in the back of an, the eye, and it's like a screen consisting of neural elements and blood vessels, and its function is to convert incoming photons of light to electrical signals. It is actually considered part of the central nervous system, and it develops as an outgrowth of brain tissue. Now, the duplexity or duplicity theory of vision states that the retina contains two kinds of photoreceptors, those specialized for light and dark detection and those that are specialized for color detection. All right, so the retina is made up of approximately 6 million cones and 120 million rods. Cones are used for color vision and to sense fine details. They're the most effective in bright light, and they come in three forms. They come in three forms, short, medium, and long, also referred to as blue, green, and red, respectively. Now, in reduced illumination, though, rods are more functional, and they only allow sensation of light and dark because they contain a signal pigment called rhodopsin. Rods have low sensitivity to details. They're not involved in color vision, but they are involved in night vision. And while there are many more rods than cones in the human eye, the central section of the retina has a high concentration of cones. Now, the connection 
the connection between the rods and cones and the optic nerve is not direct. All right, there are several layers of neurons in between, and we can kind of see that looking at this figure right here. We're going to talk about the different aspects. There are several layers of neurons in between. We have bipolar cells, we have ganglion cells, horizontal cells, and amacrine cells. Now, rods and cones, they connect with bipolar cells, which highlight gradients between adjacent rods or um, cones. So here you can see bipolar cells. Um, bipolar cells also synapse with ganglion cells. You see ganglion cells are are kind of demonstrated in this image here. This is kind of what they look like in a cartoon version. Um, and these ganglion cells, they group together to form the optic nerve. Because there are many, many, many more receptors than ganglion cells, each ganglion cell has to represent the combined activity of many rods and cones. This results in a loss of detail as information from the photoreceptors is combined. Now, as the number of receptors that converge through bipolar neurons onto one ganglion cell increases, all right, the resolution is going to decrease. On average, the number of cones converging onto an individual ganglion cell is smaller than it is for rods. Therefore, color vision has a greater sensitivity to fine detail than black and white vision does. Now, we can't forget to talk about um, amacrine cells and horizontal cells. These receive input from multiple retinal cells in the same area before the information is passed on to ganglion cells. And so they can thereby uh, uh, accentuate slight differences between the visual information in each bipolar cells. And these cells are very important for edge detection because they increase our perception of contrasts. With that being said, we can now finally move into discussing the visual pathways. The visual pathways refer to both the physical and anatomical connections between the eyes and the brain, as well as the flow of visual information among these connections. So something that's going to help us visualize this discussion is this figure right here. So we're going to look at this and we're going to try to talk about it. All right. Each eye's right visual field projects onto the left half of each um e uh, the left half of the visual field so let me reiterate that each eye's right visual field projects onto the left half of each eye's retina and each eye's left visual field projects onto the right half of each eye's retina and as the signal travels through the optic nerves towards the the brain the first significant events occurs at the optic chiasm. Here, the fibers from the nasal half of each retina are going to cross paths. And these fibers, they carry the temporal visual field from each eye. Now, because the temporal fibers do not cross in the, uh, in the chism, this reorganization means that all fibers corresponding to the left visual field from both eyes projects onto the right side of the brain. And all fibers corresponding to the right visual field from both eyes projects onto the left side of the brain. So you see this kind of like opposite orientation here. And these reorganized pathways are called optic tracts once they leave the optic um, chism or chiasm, however you pronounce that word. Now, from the optic chiasm, the information then goes to several different places in the brain. All right. It goes to the, latter, uh, the lateral genculate nucleus of the thalamus uh, through radiations in the temporal and parietal lobes to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. There are also inputs into the superior colliculus, which controls some responses actually to visual stimulus and reflexive eye movements. All right. So with that being said, it's also important now that we kind of understand a little bit about the visual pathways that we equally understand some of the processing that happens. So 
while being able to sense all light information around us is is useful in its own right, we have to be able to make sense of visual stimuli to be able to interact with the environment. One process that helps create a cohesive image of the world around us is parallel processing. This is the ability to simultaneously analyze and combine information regarding color, shape, and motion. And then these features can be compared to our memories to determine what is actually being viewed. So for most, for, for as an example, most people can recognize a moving car very easily from a distance because they're familiar with the usual motions and shapes of cars. Now, parallel processing is not only a psychological model, but it also has a correlate in neuroscience called feature detection. So our visual pathways, they contain cells that are specialized in detection of things like color, shape, or motion that helps feed into this feature detection. Now we've talked about color. We said that cones are responsible for color vision, but we haven't really elaborated on shape or motion. Shape refers not only to the three-dimensional geometry of an object, but also our ability to discriminate an object of interest from the background by detecting its boundaries. Shape is also detected by parvocellular cells, which have a very high color spatial resolution. That is, they permit us to see very fine detail when we're examining an object. Here's something though, parvocellular cells can only really work well with stationary or slow moving objects because they have very low temporal resolution. Now, motion, motion is detected by magnocellular cells. These have very high temporal resolution. What's the trade-off though? They have very low spatial resolution. So much of the rich detail of an object can no longer be seen once it's in motion. In addition, magnocellular cells provide more of a blurry but moving image of an object. With that, we've covered all our main objectives for vision, and now we can move into our third objective, which is all about hearing. The ear is a complex organ that's not only responsible for our sense of hearing, but also for both rotational and linear acceleration. This is what's called the vestibular sense. These senses are critical and important important to our ability to get around the world and their associated structures are encased in some of the densest bone of the body to really protect them from damage. So again here first and foremost we'll talk about the structure and the function of the ear before we move into discussing the auditory pathways. Here you see a little bit of the structure and anatomy of the ear. The ear is divided into three parts. It's divided into the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Now, a sound wave first reaches the outside part of the ear called the pinna or auricle. And the main function of the pinna is to channel sound waves into the external auditory canal. This is going to direct the sound waves to the tympanic membrane, also known as the eardrum. The membrane vibrates in phase with the incoming sound waves, and the frequency of the sound wave determines the rate at which the tympanic membrane vibrates. It moves back and forth at high rates for high frequency sounds, and more slowly, obviously, for low frequency sounds. In addition, louder sounds are going to have greater intensity, and that's going to correspond to an increased amplitude of this vibration. Now, the tympanic membrane, it divides the outer ear from the middle ear. All right, so this is kind of the division between the outer ear and the middle ear is here, this tympanic membrane. The middle ear, the middle ear, it houses the three smallest bones in the body called ossicles. The ossicles, they help transmit and amplify the vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. The malus is affixed to the tympanic membrane. It acts on the incus, all right, and that acts on the stapes right here. The base plate of the stapes, it rests in the oval window of the cochlea, which is the entrance to, we've made it into the inner ear. 
Now, the middle ear is connected to the navel, nasal cavity via the eustachian tube, which really helps equalize pressure between the middle ear and the environment. The inner ear sits within a bony labyrinth, which contains the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. I'm going to briefly talk about this, but we're going to hyper-focus on each of these structures in more detail here in a second. So the inner ear sits within the bony, lab bony labyrinth and it contains the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. These structures are continuous with each other and they're mostly filled by the membranous labyrinth. This is bathed with a potassium rich fluid called the endolymph. Now the membranous labyrinth, it's suspended within the bony labyrinth by a thin layer of another fluid called perilymph. Perilymph simultaneously transmits vibrations from the outside world and then it cushions the inner, the inner ear structure. So with that brief overview of the outer, middle, and inner ear, we're going to really focus on the inner ear. All right, the inner ear is going to be something that we're going to talk about in greater detail, but just as a final review, the outer ear contain, uh, consists of the pinna, the external auditory canals, and the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane really divides between the outer ear and the middle ear. The middle ear consists of ossicles. We have malus, incus, and stapes. And the footplate of the stapes, it rests on the oval window of the cochlea. Um, and then the middle ear is connected to the nasal cavity by the eustachian tube. Then we have the inner ear, and it has these three important structures that we're going to talk about here. That's the cochlea, the vestibules, and the semicircular canals. And something else that's really important is the inner ear contains the bony labyrinth. It's filled with perilymph. And we have the membranous lab uh, labyrinth. It's filled with endolymph. So with that statement, let's start to hyper-focus on the workings of the inner ear, starting first and foremost with a discussion on the cochlea. The cochlea is a spiral-shaped, you can see that kind of here, it looks like the, the shell of a snail, right? Kind of spiral-shaped organ, and it's divided into three parts called scalia. All three scalia, they run the entire length of the cochlea, and the middle scalia, it's going to house the actual hearing apparatus that's called the organ of cordy. So I'm going to kind of transition to this part where we have some of the writing so we can discuss it. This organ of cordy, it rests on a thin, flexible membrane called the basilar membrane. And the organ of cordy, it's composed of thousands of hair cells all bathed in endolymph. On top of the organ of cordy is a relatively immobile membrane that's called the tectorial membrane. The other two scalia filled with perilymph surround the hearing apparatus and they are also continuous with the oval and round windows of the cochlea. And so sound entering the cochlea through the oval window is going to cause vibrations in the perilymph, which are transmitted to the, to the basilar membrane. Now, because fluids are essentially incompressible, the round window, which is a membrane-covered hole in the cochlea, it permits the perilymph to actually move, move within the cochlea. And like the rods and cones of the eye, the hair cells in the organ of cordy, they convert this physical stimulus into an electrical signal, which is carried to the central nervous system by the auditory nerve. All right. So again, the, the cochlea is a spiral-shaped organ. It's divided into three parts. The middle part contains the actual hearing apparatus that's called the organ of cordy, and it rests on this basilar membrane. It's composed of thousands of hair cells that are bathed in endolymph. On top of the organ of cordy is a relatively immobile membrane that's called the tectorial membrane. And then the other piece of information is that the other two parts of the cochlea is filled with perilymph, and it surrounds the hearing apparatus. It's continuous with the oval and round windows of the cochlea. Now we can move on to the second part of the inner ear that we want to talk about, and that's the vestibule. The vestibule refers to the po portion of the bony, the bony labyrinth, I'm sorry, that contains the utricle and the saccule. These structures are really sensitive 
to linear acceleration. So they're used as part of the balancing apparatus and they're used to determine one's orientation in three-dimensional space. The utricle and the saccule, they contain modified hair cells covered with autoliths. And as the body accelerates, these autoliths are going to resist that motion. And so this bends and stimulates those underlying hair cells and it sends a signal to the brain. Then we have these semicircular canals. While the utricle and saccule are sensitive to linear acceleration, the three semicircular canals are going to be sensitive to rotational acceleration. The semicircular canals are arranged perpendicular to each other, and each end in the swelling is called an ampulla. This is where the hair cells are located. So when your head rotates, actually, endolymph in the semicircular canal is going to resist this motion, and it's going to do so by bending the underlying hair cells, which is going to send a signal to the brain. With that, we've covered the structure and function of the ear. We talked about the outer, middle, and inner ear. We really focused on the three parts of the inner ear, the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. Now we can have a discussion on the auditory pathways in the brain. Um, the auditory pathways in the brain are a bit more complex than the visual pathways. And so we're really just going to cover this at a very surface level. And this is kind of what you just need to know for the MCAT. No, not too many details here. Most sound information actually passes through the vestibule cochlear nerve, and it passes through that to the um, brainstem where it ascends to the medial genculate nucleus of the thalamus. From there, it projects to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe for some sound processing. Some information is also sent to the superior olive where, um, local, where it localizes the sound and also to the inferior colliculus, which is involved in that startle reflex. And it helps the eyes, it helps keeps the eyes fixed on a point when the head is turned. So that is the auditory pathway. It starts from the cochlea and it travels through the vestibule cochlear nerve to the medial genculate nucleus of the thalamus and it does that to get to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. So that's the auditory pathway in short. With that we have completed objective three and now we can finally move into objective four. Here we're going to talk about the other senses. Here we'll start off with a discussion on smell. Smell is considered one of the chemical senses, which means that it responds to incoming chemicals from the outside world. So it specifically responds to say something like a volatile compound. Now, olfactory chemoreceptors, they're located in the olfactory epithelium in the upper part of the nasal cavity. Chemical stimuli has to bind to their respective chemoreceptors to be able to cause a signal. There are a tremendous number of specific chemoreceptors which allow us to recognize subtle differences in similar scents like lavender versus jasmine, for example. Now, smell can also carry interpersonal information through the medium of pheromones. Pheromones have a detectable effect on humans, but they also play an enormous role in animals and specifically in animal social, foraging, and sexual behavior. Pheromones are secreted by one person or animal, and once bonded with chemoreceptors, they compel or urge another one to behave in a specific way. Now, as true with all senses, there is a defined olfactory pathway to the brain. We're gonna cover it in simple terms that we need to know for the MCAT. Odor molecules are going to be inhaled into the na nasal passage and then contact the olfactory nerves in the olfactory epithelium. These receptor cells are going to be activated then, sending signals to the olfactory bulb, and then these signals are then relayed via the olfactory tract to higher regions of the brain, including the limbic system. So that's smell. Next up is taste. As a sense, Taste is often more simple than we imagine. There are five basic tastes. We have 
Umami, sour, sweet, bitter, and salty. Umami is also known as savory. Now, flavor is not synonymous with taste, um, but rather it refers actually to the complex interplay between smell and taste, which can be affected by non-chemical stimuli like texture or one's mood when they're eating. Tastes are also detected by chemoreceptors. However, unlike olfactory chemoreceptors, taste receptors are really sensitive to dissolved compounds. Saltiness, for example, is a reaction to alkali metals. It's generally triggered by the sodium that's found in table salt. Sourness, on the other hand, is a reaction to acid, such as in lemons or vinegar. Um, sweet, bitter, and savory flavors are also triggered by specific molecules binding to receptors. The receptors for taste are groups of cells called taste buds, which are found in little bumps on the tongue called um, papillae. These are important, and taste information will actually travel from the taste buds to the brainstem and then ascend to the taste center in the thalamus before traveling to higher order brain regions. So we've covered smell and now we've covered taste. It's time for us to move into discuss discussing somatosensation. This is often reduced to touch when listed as a sense, but it's actually quite complex and it can be described as having four modules, pressure, vibration, pain, and temperature. All right. And to this, there are actually five different types of receptors that receive tactile information. We're going to cover these as we need to know them for the MCAT. The first we're going to cover is the Pacinian corpuscle. This responds to deep pressure and vibration. Then we have the uh, Meissner corpuscle. This responds to light touch. Merkel cells respond to deep pressure and texture. Ruffini endings, they respond to stretch, and free nerve endings respond to pain and temperature. Now, transduction occurs in the receptors, and it's going to send the signal to the central nervous system where it eventually travels to the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. There are three additional concepts that are related to touch perception that are going to be really important to know. They are the two-point threshold, physiological zero, and the gate theory of pain. Let's go ahead and start with this first one. A two-point threshold refers to the minimum distance necessary between two points of stimulation on the skin, such that the points will be felt as two distinct stimuli. The size of the two-point threshold really depends on the density of nerves in the particular area of the skin that's being tested. Now, as for physiological zero, well, temperature is judged relative to physiological zero or the no normal temperature of the skin, which is anywhere between 86, 86 and 97 degrees Fahrenheit. So an object is gonna feel cold because it's under physiological zero, and an object is gonna feel warm because it's above physiological zero. Now, pain reception is part of the somatosensory system, and it can result from signals sent from a variety of sensory receptors, most commonly referred to as nociceptors. Pain also relies on thresholds, and those, as we talked earlier about, vary greatly from person to person. For example, the idea of what temperature of water is so hot it hurts is gonna vary by several degrees between individuals. And this leads us to talk about this third point, gate theory of pain. The gate theory of pain, it proposes that there is a special quote unquote gating mechanism that can turn pain signals on or off and that affects whether or not we perceive pain. In this theory, the spinal cord is able to preferentially forward the signals from other touch uh, modules to the brain to the brain, and that reduces the sensation of pain. Now, this has been superseded by other theories, but it still is a useful model of understanding touch processing at the spinal cord level. With that, we can move into our last sense that we want to talk about, and that's kinesthetic sense. This is also called pro, uh, proprioception. It refers to the ability to tell where one's body is in space. So for example, 
even with your eyes closed, you can still describe the location and the position of your hand. The receptors for proprioception, they're found mostly in muscle and joints, and they play very critical roles in hand-eye coordination, uh, very critical roles in balance, and also mobility. With that, we move into our last and final objective called object recognition. Modern theories of object recognition assume at least two major types of psychological processing. We have bottom-up processing, also referred to as data-driven processing, and then we have top-down processing, also known as conceptually driven processing. Bottom-up processing refers to object recognition by parallel processing and feature uh, detection like we described earlier. Essentially, the brain takes the individual sensory stimuli, it combines them together to create a cohesive image before determining what that object is. Top-down is driven by memories and expectations that allow the brain to recognize the whole object and then recognize the components based on these expectations. In other words, top-down processing allows us to quickly recognize objects without needing to analyze their specific parts. Neither system, though, is sufficient by itself. If we only performed bottom-up processing, we would be extremely inefficient at recognizing objects. Every time we looked at an object, it would be like it was... It would be like we were looking at it for the first time. And so that's not very efficient. On the other hand, if we only performed top-down processing, we would have difficulty discriminating slight differences between similar objects. Now, this leads us to talk about something called perceptual organization. This refers to the ability to use the two processes in tandem with all of the other sensory clues about an object to create a complete picture of an idea. Now, most of the images we see in everyday life are incomplete. Often we may only be able to see a part of an object and then we have to infer what the rest of the object look like. Now, by using what information is available in terms of, of depth, form, motion, etc., we often fill in the gaps using Gestalt principles. And that actually leads us to talking about what Gestalt's principles are. These generally follow the same basic idea. There are ways for the brain to infer missing parts of the picture when the picture is incomplete. There are dozens of Gestalt's principles, but we're only going to refer to a couple of the ones that we need to know for the MCAT. We start off with the law of proximity, which says that elements close to one another tend to be perceived as a unit. Then we have the law of similarity. It says that objects that are similar appear to be grouped together. The law of good continuation says that elements that appear to follow the same pathway tend to be grouped together. This leads us to talking about subjective contours. This has to do with perceiving contours and therefore shapes that are not actually present in the stimulus. Then we also have law of closure. Law of closure says when a space is enclosed by a group of lines, it is perceived as a complete or closed line. And all these laws, they operate to create the most stable, consistent, and simplest figures possible within a given visual field. And so taken all together, the Gestalt's principles are governed by the law of pregnancy which says that perceptual organization will always be as regular, as simple, and as symmetric as possible. And with that, we have completed the second chapter titled Sensation and Perception. I really hope that this was helpful. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave them down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.